Hello, and welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. Thanks for spending some time with us today. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Leon Salviel, editor of the harrowing new book, Do Not Forget Me, Three Jewish Mothers Write to Their Sons from the Thessaloniki Ghetto. Saltiel's work brings together the raw emotions of three Greek Jewish women who kept on writing even as they felt the walls closing in on them. But first, one brief reminder. Check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player, and a legendary DJ. And watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Following the Axis invasion of Greece beginning in late 1940, the Nazis began persecuting the country's Jews the same way they had across the rest of occupied Europe. My guest today has a deep understanding of Greek history, especially the rich history and culture of Jews in Greece as well as the years of the Holocaust. Dr. Leon Saltiel, editor of the new book, Do Not Forget Me, Three Jewish Mothers Write to Their Sons from the Thessaloniki Ghetto, is here to delve into a deeply human side of the inhumane realities of the Holocaust. In Do Not Forget Me, Saltiel brings together letters from three women imprisoned in the Thessaloniki Ghetto who detail their own experiences with emotional intensity in the weeks before their deportation to the Auschwitz concentration camp. Leon Saltiel holds a PhD in contemporary Greek history from the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki and has received postdoctoral fellowships at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He previously published The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942-43, in 2020. Among other positions, Saltiel is a representative at UN Geneva and UNESCO and coordinator on countering anti-Semitism for the World Jewish Congress, as well as a member of the Greek delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Leon, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Dan, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be with you. Well, I'd like to uh, begin, if we can, uh, just by setting the stage. If we were to go to Thessaloniki in 1939, tell us about the Jewish community. What would it look like? What did it feel like at that time? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. And, and, and before I start, let me say what a great honor it is for me to be discussing with you, Dan a very prominent and well-respected Jewish leader who has represented the historic Day Brit International Organization with eloquence, determination, and many important achievements in your career. So thank you again. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be discussing with you today. Thank you, Leon. Thanks again for being with us. Um, so, so to go back in the pre-war Thessaloniki, um, let me let me start uh, first of all to say that Thessaloniki was marked uh, in uh, with the, with the arrival of the Spanish Jews fleeing the Spanish uh, Inquisition in 1492. So the city uh, became really a predominant Jewish city. It's the only Jewish city in Europe with a majority Jewish population in a very big part of its history. Um, so much so that in 1912 when the Greek army entered the city. Up until now, up until then, the city was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, more than 50% of the city's population were Jewish. So we speak about a city of 150,000 people, of which 70 to 80,000 people are Jews, who really mark the, the city and all of its functions. Um, the market is closed on Saturday. Um, Jewish life and Jewish merchants, Jewish businessmen, politicians. Really, it's, it's one of the very rare jewels of Jewish life in Europe where one can say it's really a Jewish city. Um, in the interwar period, as the city is being integrated into a Greek state, 
it's losing a lot of this multi uh, culturality that characterized the city in its uh, in the previous centuries don't forget there's a big fire that burns most of the jewish neighborhoods in 1917 then you have the big economic crash of 1929 um, you have the greek turkish war of 1922 with an influx of uh, refugees christian refugees greek christian refugees from anatolia from the former uh, from what is becoming modern Turkey. And, and by the eve of the Second World War, you have 250,000 people living in the city, of which now less than 50,000 are Jews. So from a city where Jews were uh, almost the absolute majority, now they're around 20 to 25% of the population. Many of the Jews have been immigrated not only to Palestine, but also to France, to the United States, Latin America, and uh, France and other places in Europe. Well, I ask because um, it, it really was one of the one of the great Jewish cities, one of the iconic uh, Jewish communities. Of course, B'nai B'rith's uh, own presence was extremely important in the city. Uh, our Salonika Lodge, which was founded in 1914 uh, by a Greek parliamentarian David Matalone, had a, an illustrious uh, history, and uh, it created the schools and a public library, conferences. I think they, they even published. Uh, or funded a major a Ladino language uh, newspaper, uh, poetry book. Uh, so these were impressive accomplishments, but the community of course had many organizations, uh, many publications. Uh, and really when you, when you look at Europe uh, on the eve of World War II, uh, it, it was in that, in that upper tier of iconic uh, Jewish centers uh, of, uh, of life, of learning, uh, and of great accomplishment. So let's start with your expertise in Greek history, your extensive writing about Greece leading up to and during the Holocaust. Uh, last year, you published the Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942-1943, a book that highlights the last days of, of the community. Uh, can you briefly compare Do Not Forget Me uh, to your first book? It seems as though the new book takes on a more personal approach. Well, uh, thank you for, for making this uh, linkage, uh, Dan. Um, uh, in fact, this new book that just came out in English, um, the, the letters that are contained therein, uh, I, I came across them during my PhD research, which is uh, the, the, the result of the PhD research is the, the, book, the first book that you mentioned, The Holocaust in Thessaloniki. Um, in my PhD research, trying to, to see what was happening in the city during the Holocaust, I wanted to, to see as the Jews were suffering under German persecution and German humiliation, how was the city reacting to it? So I looked extensively into local archives, local and foreign archives, to see how the mayor, uh, how the different business associations, the church, the Red Cross, uh, the newspapers, the political class was reacting uh, to the Holocaust as, as it was developing. And to do that, I was primarily interested in contemporary sources. I wanted to see how people were perceiving the events as they were unfolding. Not so much see uh, post-war testimonies of survivors where they, are they, they tell the stories, but often they tell the stories with hindsight, knowing what happened. I wanted to see how people were perceiving the events as they were developing. And as I was conducting my research, I, I came across this trove of almost 60 letters written by mothers during these uh, tragic events. And, and I felt that if they were integrated into a very historic um, uh, book uh, with a very sort of like a lot of footnotes, they will lose their authenticity and that they merit a publication as a separate volume. So this is the volume that just came out. Um, uh, couple of weeks ago, let me say that the, the letters, interestingly enough, are written in French because French was the Liga Franca of, uh, the, Eastern, of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in that time. A lot has to do with the network of Alliance Israeli schools that um, came to, uh, to bring to the Jewish community sort of like the Western culture. The book came out in Greek in 2018 and met a big uh, editorial success. And now with the English version, we hope to reach out to the whole world. 
and to take the story of the Jews of Saloniki through the lens of, three, of these three mothers known to the whole world and also through your podcast to, your, to the Bnei Brit membership. Because the Holocaust, uh, unfortunately, has left us with so many untold and, and lesser known stories. Uh, 76 years on, there continue to be stories because there were 6 million stories. It's, it's not only 6 million, it's 6 million stories. Now, what, what prompted you um, to, to bring uh, the stories in particular of, of Serena Saltiel, uh, Mathilde Baruch, and, and Nayama Kazes together? And was it emotionally difficult for you to examine the letters because you're so deeply uh, involved in in, the, in this reading of, of Greek history and Greek Jewish history? As you say, there are six million stories of, of victims of the Holocaust, but often they are forgotten in the big narrative or they're also forgotten due to lack of, to lack of sources. Uh, some letters have been found, have been published, some by Yad Vashem, but they are fragments. It's one letter here, one letter there. What is the unique find in these letters that you have around 15 to 20 letters per mother? So you can really follow their lives, read their stories, feel their, uh, their pain and their suffering, and all this through the unique relationship between mother and son, which is something universal and goes beyond the limits of the Saloniki or Greece during the war or even of the Holocaust. It speaks a universal language of love uh, and, and family. And through this lens, you perceive these tragic events, which is a very unique uh, viewpoint. Another interesting element is that these letters are intimate uh, correspondence. They were never meant to be published. They were never meant to, to come to me, to my hands, to be edited and to be published. And in that sense, they contain so much, uh, they're so original and so emotional that they, they touch everybody. So the Holocaust story becomes a very personal story and people can very easily relate to it. These are the elements that I saw that really, um, uh, came to my understanding that this book has to come out. These stories have to be known, have to be read by the general public. Um, and, um, and that's how I, I came to this uh, publication. I see that um, you, a few individuals, uh, including Zanette Patino, the director of the Jewish Museum uh, in Greece, uh, contributed introductions to the letters uh, that appear in your book. Uh, how do their perspectives enhance and broaden the contents of these letters. Well, you, thank you. And you mentioned uh, Zanet Batinu, who is the director of the Jewish Museum of Greece. And um, um, the archives of two of the, the letters of two of the mothers are found in the archives of the Jewish Museum of Greece. And they were saved thanks to their immense collection. So I want to thank them for uh, trusting me with uh, the, the, this material. And, and that's why Zanet is uh, contributing to the introduction, um, um, placing uh, these letters within the collections of the Jewish Museum of Greece. Uh, another uh, person who wrote an introduction to the Greek version, which is included in this book, is Yanis Boutaris, the mayor of Thessaloniki at the time, for, he served for eight years, who really opened up the city uh, to the Jewish world and reconciled Thessaloniki with its Jewish history. So he uh, contributed uh, uh, introduction as well, as, as did uh, Sir Sklasfeld, the very famous um, Nazi hunter from uh, France, uh, who also has done extensive work on the Holocaust, its memory and education of the Holocaust. Um, so, and I, and I also have an introduction, my own introduction, where I try to give this historical context to allow the reader to be more able to to place these letters within the journal developments what was happening in the city and the country at the time. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because in that separate essay, uh, you um, historically, as you say, contextualize uh, the letters uh, in Do Not Forget Me. What was the political climate in Thessaloniki during the late 1930s leading up to the Holocaust? What, what, was, the, or what was the state of anti-Semitism uh, in the city at that time? Interesting question, um, because um, um, interwar antisemitism went through different uh, waves. So um, in the uh, end of the 20s and beginning of the 30s, you really have extensive 
uh, anti-Semitic incidents in Thessaloniki, uh, newspapers uh, writing anti-Semitic libels, the government being hostile uh, towards the Jewish community, trying also to make the city purely Greek. Uh, as I said, as we discussed earlier, it was a very a city with a very prominent Jewish character. Uh, so the government is trying to um, make uh, Sunday rest obligatory. So by that way, making uh, Jews lose an extra day of work um, and, and different measures like that. Um, and, and also there was um, the protocols of the elder of Zion became prominent, they were circulating. In 1931, there is a pogrom in a Jewish neighborhood that was instigated by, by some local grievances. So the end of the 20s and beginning of the 30s are very tense. Until in the end of the 30s, uh, a dictator by the name of Ioannis Metaxas comes, uh, comes about. And actually, it's very interesting because Metaxas is a man of contradiction. On the one hand, he's a dictator. He brings a, mili a military uh, dictatorship system uh, inspired by, the, by Mussolini. But at the same time, he's not anti-Semitic. So he outlaws all the anti-Semitic organizations that exist. And he actually has a quite pro-Jewish approach. So it's a very difficult to, to understand today, but to be pro-Mussolini, pro-fascist, and pro-Jewish at the same time. Um, so Metaxas really gave the Jewish community comfort and great peace and stability in the last years before the Second World War. Uh, Metaxas uh, dies shortly after the, the Axis invasion against Greece. Um, having said that, the Jews fought in huge numbers with the Greek army to oppose the invading Italian army and then the German army. So the Jewish community, I think because of Metaxas' rule, in the five years before the end of the, before the start of the war, really felt a strong belonging uh, with their new uh, nation, the Greek nation that was they were now being part of it, getting integrated. Well, then we get to the Nazi occupation in Greece. Uh, explain the situation, if you will, in Thessaloniki and the rest of the country uh, once uh, Germany had invaded. So Germany, um, Italy loses the war uh, because of the courageous Greek resistance, uh, and Germany is forced to change its plans and come and help their Axis ally. So Germany invades uh, Greece and uh, occupies Thessaloniki in um, April 1940, uh, 1940. So um, the city is then divided into three zones. Um, Germany takes over Thessaloniki, the port of Piraeus, the border area with Turkey, and few islands in the Aegean of strategic importance as well as part of Crete. Uh, Bulgaria, another Axis ally, takes uh, the regions of Greece south of the country of Bulgaria and actually annexes them, giving Bulgaria access to the Mediterranean. And the rest of the country is taken over by Italy who is having uh, the upper hand in Greek affairs. And this is important because the three mothers live in uh, German-occupied Thessaloniki, whereas their sons live in Italian-occupied Athens. And the Italians didn't enforce the same anti-Semitic measures like the Germans did. In fact, because of the Italian resistance, the Germans were not able to enforce anti-Semitic measures to the whole of the country, and only implemented them initially in Thessaloniki. So the first measure um, was started in uh, July 1942 with the forced uh, assembly of all Jewish males um, in uh, the so-called Liberty Square of Thessaloniki. Um, and uh, this led to forced labor works by the Jews. Uh, they had to pay a ransom to be released. They destroyed the Jewish cemetery in December um, 1942, and the actual uh, ghettoization, the Yellow Star, and the deportations begin in the beginning of 1943. Well, let's talk about the, the three mothers uh, whose letters you chose to publish, uh, Serena Saltiel, Mathilde Baruch, and Neama Kazes. What did you discern from each of their letters about how the three women 
differed and how were they alike? And what was the most challenging about weaving these stories and these voices together? So what's interesting is that you have three witnesses who describe the events living in the same city in different areas, not knowing each other, um, and narrating the reality to their sons. So it's a common pattern on the same events, which gives also the book a rare multi-perspectiveness. You don't have only one uh, narrator, you have three narrators who are also having many similarities as being women and mothers. On the other hand, they differ. Um, Sarina Salkiel is the youngest uh, in her 40s. Um, Baruch is in, their, in her uh, 50s, uh, Kazes in her 60s. So you also have a bit of an age difference. Um, you can see also different educational levels. Uh, you can see um, the, two, uh, the two older women are widows. Saltier has an extended family and extended network of friends. So through their books, you also hear about their, their family, their immediate surroundings, an interaction not only within the family, but also within the Jewish community, within the neighborhood, but also within Greek Christians' neighbors. So you have many elements that come into the letters. It's not just one person speaking. You have stories of multiple people who are illuminating uh, these stories. As I said, these stories, these, these, um, these letters are written in French, um, but they also contain uh, elements in Judeo-Spanish. Because when really the things become very hard, the women resort to Judeo-Spanish, which is not a formal language of writing, it's more of a, the language of intimate oral conversation within families. So uh, a big part of these letters was to decipher this sort of like language uh, soup, where you have Greek, Hebrew, Turkish, Spanish, French, all coexisting uh, together, and try to preserve some of this um, language diversity in an English translation. So a lot of these words are footnoted to, to show to the reader the different words and languages used in different um, uh, parts. Another thing that was difficult, I had to resort to older, older people from the community, is to try and understand the different foods, the diseases, the names that they use of the time, which ha have been lost to our days. So it, it meant a lot of research. Um, but it was also, for me, difficultly emotionally to read their tragic stories. Um, but also, it was a great sense of fulfillment that I was able to make the voices heard for the future generations. Well, as you said earlier, Leon, uh, these letters, of course, were meant to be personal. These were letters from mothers to sons. They weren't meant to be public. Um, but beyond the the personal uh what did the mothers choose to reveal to their sons about their lives and feelings at that moment in other words we you know we talked earlier about you know the walls are closing in um is there um is there a a desperate um uh sense uh to to what it is they're conveying to their sons and is there anything about the holocaust in Thessaloniki the the or the uh, the atmosphere, uh, the anti-Jewish atmosphere in Thessaloniki, perhaps that uh, revealed something new that, that you hadn't known before. So, so the letters, thank you for this question, Dan. The letters start in different times, but most of them start towards the end of 1942, before, uh, or the summer and autumn of 1942, before the anti-Semitic measures intensify. The mothers are cautious, uh, and they describe their daily lives the difficulties they face, but not focusing on the anti-Semitic elements of this. As the winter of 1943 starts, with the Jewish, with the anti-Semitic measures initiating and intensifying, the mothers are trying to keep a cool approach. I think it's important to see what they tell and what, and what they don't tell, meaning what, how they censor themselves. I think initially I have a feeling that they said some that they said of themselves, they didn't want their sons to be worried. They didn't want to alarm the children. They didn't want to make the children sad. Uh, and maybe they thought that this is something that would pass quickly. Maybe they thought it was something temporary. 
maybe they were thought that was something that would change in the near future. But as they see the measures expanding and intensifying, you can really see this feeling of desperation that you talked about then. And, and there, they really open their hearts to the children and they write, as they, as they say themselves, with crying eyes, with the tears falling on the letters themselves, uh, the paper of the letters. And, and they really open their heart to their sons. They explain in detail their suffering, very close to the deportation date. Um, and, and they really use words like final blow, our, our end is approaching, uh, I'll never see you again. And thus the title of the book, which is actually a quote from the letters, do not forget me. So for me, what's interesting, again, from the perspective of a historian, trying to detach myself from being a member of the community and looking at things from the perspective of a historian, is that although they didn't know what was the Holocaust, they didn't know where they were ending up to, they didn't know what was Auschwitz, that they were, had no idea of dust chambers and of crematoria, they knew they were not going to a good destination. They knew they would not survive the voyage or the destination. They knew they would never see the children again. And I think that's important for us to understand that even if the Jews of Thessaloniki, but possibly beyond, did not really know the exact details of the final solution, they could sense it. They could feel it. They saw how the Germans were treating them. They saw the hunger. They saw the first deportation trains with 60, 70 people on one wagon, no food, no sanitation, no water. They saw old people, young people, pregnant women, sick people, all sent off. They knew that was not a benign occupier sending them for relocation. They knew they were going to die. Uh, so that also for me raises questions. First of all, it gives me, it helps me understand how people were thinking and perceiving the events of the time, and also opens up new ways to then address how the authorities responded, because if, the, if these people had these feelings, I'm sure the whole city had the same feelings. So the Holocaust was not an isolated event that affected a few people in a ghetto. A whole city could feel this. Don't forget, as we discussed, the Jews were 20, 25% of the city living in very central areas, occupying positions in business, in politics, in, in commerce, in education. Um, so it wasn't a, a, something that happened far away. So the fact that everybody could see it and feel it raises new questions about how they responded to it. Did the um, contents of the letters lend themselves well to translation? Because again, uh, you're going from one language to another. These are personal letters. These aren't uh, just normal, you know, one language to another where a translator uh, does the documents. Uh, this, this had to uh, be a situation where the emotion uh, was conveyed. Um, how closely did you work with the translator uh, in, in uh, allowing the emotion to, uh, to come through as it does in your book? Well, uh, Jenny Dimitriou, who translated the letters, did an excellent job in trying to keep this emotion and this authenticity of the letters. Um, as I said, I came with footnotes to try and preserve some of the, of the, um, of the multiple languages used in the letters, be it Greek or Turkish or Hebrew or Spanish. Um, it also, the, the language used tells you a lot about the linguistic uh, realities of the time. So for example, they use Greek, trans, Greek expressions translated into French to see how they were integrated into Greek culture, so much so that they were translating Greek expressions into French, which to a French reader would not mean much. So you have to explain all these things to the reader. And, and uh, now then I'm working with, uh, with some friends to try and publish this book in actually the French language, uh, which actually will be the original letters without translation, where people can see this linguistic diversity of the letters and could better appreciate the language used. And in that way, we try not to correct the mistakes. We try to include the mistakes as they, as they write them, because these letters, I think the mothers wrote them, immediately put them in an envelope and sent them out. They didn't go over more to correct typos or correct spelling or correct, you know, some things that didn't make sense. So we also tried to, to respect the original text, 
and whenever something wasn't clear, to, to explain it, not to try to direct the mothers, but to explain it to the reader what, how, uh, what they try to, to say. We have time for one more question, uh, and uh, it kind of brings things current. Uh, I see that the, the president of Greece herself uh, read three of Nina Kazessa's letters at the 2020 Dimitria Festival in Thessaloniki. Uh, what were your discussions with her about the letters, uh, and why is it so important for a Greek leader to publicly read them? Uh, and finally, what did these particular letters express? And how did you respond to this reading on a personal basis? Um, so, uh, indeed, as you say, uh, the letters became part of a documentary that um, uh, was part of a cultural festival organized by the city of Thessaloniki. And one of the women who were chosen to read the letters is the president of the Republic, Katerina Sikalaropoulou. Uh, and she's uh, not only an exceptional leader, but she's also the first ever Greek woman to hold the office of the president. So to have the first ever Greek woman president of Greece to read some of these letters was very touching for me and also a very important gesture towards the Jewish community. Um, she read them with eloquence. And also you can see visibly in the documentary that she's touched and she is, uh, is, is crying uh, while reading them. So this summer I had the chance to actually meet with her because during COVID, we couldn't actually physically meet. Uh, I met with her, she accepted me at the presidential mansion where she would discuss um, uh, the book and the letters and how she felt as a mother herself, the importance of these letters and how it was difficult for her because her job was a judge uh, previously. Uh, she was a, uh, a senior judge in Greece to actually become a narrator of, of letters, of correspondence, in a, in a documentary. And she stressed to me the importance of preserving this memory, of uh, fighting anti-Semitism, but also the responsibilities of the Greek government to not let this story be forgotten and to keep on to, to educate the young generations and also to fight any effort to deny and negate the Holocaust. Now, in a personal level, um, it's important to note for your audience that I'm not related to Sarina Saltiel, although we have the same last name. Saltiel is a, is a big family from Thessaloniki. So I have no familiar ties with these women, but any of the three could have been my grandmother. Um, and I'm saying that with, uh, with, um, with sadness because this story is a story that was felt by the communities. So me, by enabling the life, the stories of these three women, I enable the stories of all these people who were silently or less silently going through this ordeal during this time. And by letting their voices be known and published for a wider audience in multiple languages, I think that's my way of paying homage to their memory and to their suffering so that their memory may never be lost and that their stories become a source of inspiration to all of us to make a better world for us and for our children. Well, the book is Do Not Forget Me, Three Jewish Mothers Write to Their Sons from the Thessaloniki Ghetto by Dr. Leon Saltiel, and it's available wherever you purchase books. Leon, we really appreciate your joining us and sharing the humanity and uh, the love of three Jewish mothers in the face of Nazi barbarism. Uh, every victim deserves to have their story told with dignity. You have done this uh, with this magnificent book. Uh, we congratulate you on it, and uh, thank you for being with us. Dan, thank you for your leadership, thank you for your time, and thank you for uh, spotlighting uh, this book to your audience. Uh, hopefully, they will appreciate it as much as uh, you did and uh, the other readers of, of the Greek audience that has seen it already in the Greek version. Thank you so much. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, benebrit.org to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Thanks to the author, editor, and historian, Dr. Leon Saltiel, for joining me. And as always, thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Dan Mariashin. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>